Hi everyone, I'm Cory Anatato, the executive producer of Tell Us About Yourself, conversations with game show contestants. Our first season has come to a close and our host Christian Carrion is taking a well-deserved break. He'll be back in the new year with new episodes of the podcast. Meanwhile, I'll be replaying some of our favorite episodes, giving you a chance to listen again to some of the greatest stories we have from the stars of your favorite game shows, the contestants. We couldn't do this without your help, so we appreciate you listening and supporting the podcast. We also could not have done this without the support of the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play. The National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong preserves the history of game shows from the earliest panel shows and quiz scandals to the games and puzzles of the 1970s to the Big Money Network series and the classic games now in primetime. You can learn more about the archives or the museum itself at their website, museumofplay.org. We would also appreciate if you visited our Patreon page. You can support the podcast for as little as $1 per month. You can check that out and more at patreon.com slash Now, without further ado, here's an encore episode of Tell Us About Yourself, Conversations with Game Show Contestants. about yourself, would you? Tell us something about you. For any new viewers, why don't you tell us again about yourself? We've met before, but let's meet again. Tell us about yourself. Well, can you tell us about yourself? Perhaps you'd fill us in again and tell us about yourself. I'm Christian Carey, 25 West 52nd Street, New York City, the Paley Center for Media, the place where I first saw an episode of Jeopardy from its premiere year, 1964. For generations of viewers, even as Jeopardy celebrates its seventh decade on the air, it's difficult to imagine how deep the roots of America's favorite quiz show, which premiered on NBC as a replacement for the Ed McMahon-hosted panel game Missing Links, truly run. My next guest had the pleasure of being a contestant on Art Fleming's Jeopardy in the late 1970s, and would have a unique role a few years later in the development of the version of the game show that is well known and loved today. He went on to become a writer for Jeopardy as well as other game shows, and he had many stories to tell of his contestant appearances, from solving puzzles with Jack Clark on Crosswits, to his most recent venture on an upcoming episode of GSN's Tug of Words. Carlo. Welcome to the show. Tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Carlo Pano. I'm a freelance writer and a part-time uh, guest research specialist at a well-known uh, theme park and studio in Los Angeles. I have been on four game shows in 1976. I was on Crosswits. In 1978, I was on Jeopardy. In 2019, I think it was, I was on Best Ever Trivia Show. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was on Tug of Words. And I also saw that your son won on Wheel of Fortune recently. Congratulations to the whole family. <laughs> yes, last yeah, just last week. It's it's always uh, a nice when your son goes into the family business. Absolutely, <laughs> it's a it's a fun business to be in for sure. Yeah, absolutely, Carlo. I usually start these conversations by asking the person that I'm talking to what their relationship was with game shows before they became a contestant. So I'd like to do that. I'd like to rewind with you for a minute and talk about. What game shows meant to you before you became not only a contestant, but part of the game show industry? What were game shows for you growing up? 
I was a fan. It was my favorite kind of television. Uh, back when I was growing up and my parents used the uh, television set as a babysitter, I would spend hours watching shows in the 1950s. I grew up on concentration and tic-tac-toe and uh, the different games. There are a lot of local games here in Los Angeles. Uh, Johnny Gilbert hosted one called um, Beat the Odds. And Jack Nars had one called Seven Keys, which was later picked up by the ABC network. And they were just, uh, that was my go-to entertainment. That was what I really liked to watch. You know, I've talked to so many contestants and concentration has come up in so many people's memories. There's something about that show and that game that just sticks in people's minds as one of their favorites. What was it about concentration that attracted you, for instance? Well, I'll tell you, it was an evolution. Initially, I liked being able to match the numbers to actually, you know, put, oh, the oh the forfeit one gift, that's under number 19. And then as time went on, I became very adept at uh, solving the puzzles. So it was really an, a, uh, an evolution for me. So for anybody listening, concentration, I mean, it was on for, for, for years and years, and I think the Alex Trebek version is still on in reruns to this day. But yes. essentially, it's a grid of squares. Each square contains a prize. Two contestants call numbers, try to match the prizes. If they match them, they keep them. And then that reveals a picture puzzle underneath. And then to solve the pu- to bring your prizes home, you have to solve that puzzle. Right. And it had home and, versions for years and years. And I think mm-hmm. some people might even know it more as a board game than as a TV show. Because I think that as the years went on, they didn't advertise the TV show on the front of the board game. I think it's something that a lot of kids probably had in their closets for years and years. Right. And they, they didn't know that there was a TV show to go with it. Right. Well, that was me. Yeah. I, you know, my mom and I used to play Concentration when I was young. And this mm-hmm. is in the you know, mid nineties or so. So there was no concentration on, it wasn't on game show network. There was no YouTube. And so, yeah, I knew it as a board game. I was fascinated to know that it was on TV. It's a fascinating Mm -hmm. game. And it's one that even in reruns, I think it, you know, it holds up. It holds up. And the one thing I found really interesting, uh, I've been a credit reader since I was a small child. And there was a man who was an artist named Bernard Schmidtke, who was, graphic artist on all three iterations of concentration what an amazing job to have yeah i mean he was uh in the he worked on the one in new york and then when they revived it with jack nars here in la he worked on that and then when they did it again for nbc he was on that one too i think we actually just lost uh norm blumenthal recently within the past couple of days yeah i just saw that yeah i was sorry to hear that yeah, there, there was there was a there was a kind of coded thing in concentration. Uh, a mint always had a bite out of it. So right. You saw if you saw a disc with teeth marks, you knew that was a mint. <laughs> it's a wonderful language that they had. I know that a drop of water could be lots of things. It was if it was off mm-hmm. of a flower, it was dew. If it was right. from an eye, it was a tear. And then thank mm-hmm. God for the leather tool known as the awl. That oh, probably yes. came into so many puzzles throughout the years mm-hmm. on concentration. And the thing that looked like uh, three quick right angles when the uh, box above it turned around, you saw that it was L-E-E. Right. <laughs> I remember reading that they had difficulty going to color when color television started becoming really popular because they were afraid that that would make the puzzles too easy to grasp, where they said, you know, if there's a banana in the puzzle and uh, mm-hmm. A box flips around and there's just the top of it. You can see it's yellow. You can see it's spotted. You'll know what that is. It'll ruin the show. And I think eventually what they did, they just made the puzzles all a uniform background color and just drew them out in, you know, white outline on the, on the, yeah, uh, they were, they were kind of like gray on brown. I remember seeing them in color when they finally went to color on NBC, but that was early 70s. At what point does it cross your mind that you could become a contestant on a show? Because that's a big jump to make from being a viewer to being a participant. And it requires, I think, a different mindset. What was that moment for you, if you remember it? Well, I I tried out for a lot of shows. I mean, I was this uh, wide-eyed kid who thought, sure, he could just uh, win at everything. So I tried out for Hollywood Squares. I tried out for Tic Tac Doe. I tried out for a lot of shows, and I finally got on Crosswits in 1976. But I just 
always thought I could do that. So it wasn't really a transition. So CrossFit's in 1976. Now that right. was, and that's another show that ran for five years and surprisingly mm -hmm. underrepresented when it comes to talking about, you know, the classic shows of the 70s. This was mm -hmm. like celebrity crosswords. So you had Jack right. Clark as host and each player mm -hmm. had two celebrity partners that they could... Right. You know, you could choose which of your partners you wanted to attack a certain word on the board, and they had these cute sort of clues, and all the words in the mm -hmm. puzzle added up to the identity of something. Uh, that right. was that must have been a really fun show. Do you remember who your celebrities were? Oh yeah, uh, it was Artie Johnson and Pat McCormick. Oh, those are great players too. And the oh yeah, they were the pantheon great players. of every celebrity contestants. Those were really good ones. Yeah, and Pat McCormick. I mean, I'd always been a fan of his, and Artie Johnson was you know uh, laughing and just finished, so I knew who they were. And I remember I got, we had one puzzle and I was, I thought, sure, I knew what it was. And Artie Johnson just scared me down and hissed at me. It's Charlie Brown. Say Charlie Brown. It's Charlie <laughs> Brown. And I gave in and it was Charlie Brown. And I felt a lot better about that. I, I bet you did. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, Crosswitz is a very fun show hosted by a guy who I think is severely underrated, Jack Clark, who was a famous oh, announcer, yeah. didn't get a lot of mm -hmm. on-air hosting opportunities, but this was easily his longest-running yeah. show. What do you remember about uh -huh. working in the presence or playing in the presence of Jack Clark? Um, he was never at a loss for words. He was as, as friendly as you can be from across the you know from across the studio. But I remember he just uh, kept the ball rolling. Later, I was much more impressed with Jack Clark when I saw him on Wheel because he was the announcer for Wheel for years. And whatever happened, he could just have a comment to just top whatever just went on screen. Well, that was also in the days when Wheel of Fortune was a shopping show. So he had a lot of right. copy to read uh, mm -hmm. in a very unpredictable pattern. I seem to remember, I, I don't know who I heard this from, but he would have all of the prizes on, indiv on individual index cards. And as the contestant uh -huh. was picking what they wanted to bring home, he would organize them like an order of value. And that's a very high pressure announcing job. And it takes a very special kind of announcer to do that properly, I think. Yeah, and also to lead them in and segue between them because you've got to do that on the fly. Yes, very impressive to be able to do that in you know in front of an audience, and I think he was one of the best at mm. that. What did you I win agree. on CrossFit, if you don't mind me asking? I won a couch. It was a couch from Broy Hill of Lenoir, Lenoir, North Carolina, and I had it for almost 40 years. So this wasn't... <laughs> I don't, so this clearly wasn't the grand prize. It was not the grand prize. I won. I got one puzzle right, and I um, and I got a couch, and they shipped it to me, and I kept it at my house. And then when I moved in with my girlfriend, and uh, it was with us for a good almost forty years. Your couch lasted a lot longer than my couch lasted. I won a sofa on the Price Is Right when <laughs> I turned eighteen, and I think it lasted maybe three years or so before it just snapped wow. clear in half down the middle. Mm. You no, know, th this had a, this had a bed in it and it was, it was a really well-made piece of uh, work. We, um, we recovered it because eventually it got too beat up, but we had, it worked for a long, long time. What made Crosswitz your first show? Was that something that you had watched for a while and figured you'd be good at it or just, or was it just the first opportunity that sort of presented itself? It was the first one that called me back. Um, it was the first one that had, you know, they showed interest, you know, they, they showed interest and I was willing to do it. It was a uh, matter of opportunity. You know, I was just, you know, going out all over the place when I went to a, when I went to any game show and I went to a lot of them, they would say, you know, if you'd like to be a contestant, please stay after the show and we'll talk to you. So you were in the audience for quite a few shows before you became a contestant. Yes. I would love to hear about your experiences being in the audience of a bunch of game shows in California in the 70s. Because to me, as a game show fan, that is that's the golden era in the perfect place to, you know, to put on a game show. What did you see? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a lot of Hollywood squares, a lot of Hollywood squares, which was really interesting because the two pieces of the set faced each other. 
you never saw the contestants because they had their backs to the audience. And you could see the celebrities because they were facing the audience, but the but Peter Marshall and the two uh, contestants were off to one side looking right at him. So if you came there to see your Uncle Morty on the show, forget it, Charlie. You're never going to see him. A lot of Heater Quigley shows were set up that way. I remember watching Gambit with Wink Martindale, and that was the same thing. You can mm-hmm. never tell what type of room they were shooting that show in, and it was actually only recently, and recently I mean within the last month or two months, that I saw a photo of the actual set, and it looks nothing the way it would look on TV. They were very good at, at, at sort of hiding their, you know, their whole setup. They must have gotten that from Hollywood Squares. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you, it was very practical. It worked very well for them because eye contact and you know direct communication between the host and the celebrities and the contestants was quite important. So they just you know they they made it work for the cameras and they made it work for the players. And if you happen to be in the audience, hey, good luck. Right. I would love to know what the atmosphere was like in the audience of the Hollywood Squares. It seemed like such a raucous show, especially in the seventies. Uh, actually, it was pretty sedate. I mean, people were laughing. Uh, funny stuff would happen. And you'd cheer for the people who won, and you'd uh, get very excited when the Secret Square was announced. But, you know, the, the real craziness happened to things like the Gong Show. Oh, the Gong Show. What a great show to be in the audience of. Oh, it was amazing. Li- and they had a live band. Right, Milton DeLug. And the band with a thug. That's right. And I, I only recently... Yeah, you know, years after the show wrapped, I realized the reason they always played ho- "Hoop de Doo" at the end of the show was that Milton had written it. Oh, what a nice favor, right? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let, let me get a little money on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Wow, and that was, of course, hosted by the 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 incomparable Chuck Barris, who I think is Chuck Barris. Is, yes, could not have been more perfect for that role. Mm-hmm. Well, he apparently had a lot of people who wanted to, he wanted to try somebody else, but he wanted, he said it worked best with an amateur host. Yeah, he had tried it with a couple of other people, if I remember correctly. I think Gary Owens had a shot at it and John Barber mm-hmm. had a shot at it. And nobody really understood what that role was supposed to be until Chuck Barris mm-hmm. himself stepped in. What was it like watching him work, you know, off camera as an audience member? Well, uh, the one thing I remember is whenever there was a dog act, he would uh, go off to the side. There was a bowl of dog food and he would rub it on his crotch so that when he got back (laughs) on stage, the dogs would head to his crotch. (laughs) Classic. He knows what sells, I guess. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. A cheap visual gag. He's trying to, you know, get the scores. (laughs) Right. That's wonderful. And I remember one time... They're, they were taping the show, which was going to air on Christmas. And all of the judges gave every act 10 points. So it was like a nine-way tie. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Tis the season, and right? <laughs> Chuck, yeah. And, and Chuck said, we have a tie. And he turned to the judges and said, thanks a lot. <laughs> How nice of them. Wow, what a surreal experience that must be. I think people don't realize what an enormous uh, social phenomenon the gong show was at its peak in the late 70s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was really something. I, I stopped going when there were too many idiots who started clapping every time. Ch- you know, Chuck had this nervous habit of clapping his hands, and like everybody would do it with him. And at that point, I figured, no, nah, this is, you know, Group therapy for idiots. I don't want to do this anymore. Sure. Sure. I can. So I, so I stopped going. And we are now yeah. heading into 1978, and this is your appearance uh-huh. on Jeopardy. Now, there was a version of Jeopardy in the late 70s hosted by Art Fleming, right. and it was the right. same core concept, a couple of little differences. There was a bonus round, but you still had right. the answers in the form of questions, and you had Art Fleming. Right. Were you a fan right. of Art Fleming's Jeopardy before you appeared on on this version? I was a fan of the show. Um, I I found him kind of neutral. I, you know, he was just, he was like a Rotarian. Hi there, welcome, glad to have you. You know, welcome to our show. Um, I never thought he was a really good host, but he was very warm and very friendly, and he uh, handled the material well. 
he was, you know, he knew that he didn't know, so he would do his homework. Yeah, that show, I think, requires a host that can look like they would know the answer if it wasn't in front of them. And he had he mm-hmm. had a difficult job sometimes. I remember hearing a story about how sometimes, you know, back in the old Jeopardy, there were no TV monitors. It was all cardboard and glitter. And so when somebody called right. Art for 30, they'd pull the card, and that's how you saw the clue behind the uh, behind the dollar value. Sometimes those cards would come in upside right. down or backwards, and he'd have to do his mm-hmm. best to sort of tap dance and ad-lib around that. That's a very strong right. – that's a very – sharp skill to have as a game show host, I think, that ability to ad lib. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I remember one time when I was on Jeopardy and I was playing the Super Jeopardy board and I was in a theater category and the and the clue came up, theater of the absurd playwright and author of Rhinoceros. And I said, who is Eugene Ionesco? And he said, Ionesco is correct. And only later did I realize he was alerting the staff that he only had Ionesco there. Got it. I don't know if he's right on Eugene or not, but Ionesco is correct. Right. That's sort of Morse code between the host and the the people at the table. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because that that was one of my things I, I liked to do is, you know, add a little extra information to intimidate my opponents. Sure, let them. I'll let them think you know more than you do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. What were, in terms of categories, your strengths when you played Jeopardy that first time? Pop culture. I was good on pop culture, uh, and my board was loaded with them. And there was a whole Robert Redford category, and there was some wordplay. But I was really lucky because my opponents melted down. When they said who was going to play the next game, the returning champion said, oh, no, not Carlo, because she was already afraid of me. And uh, at in this aberrant form of Jeopardy, what they did was the person with the lowest score was uh, sent home at the end of the Jeopardy round. And she was sent home. And then in the double Jeopardy round, the woman who was left... A, um, she was a housewife, maybe 10 years older than me. I was 26 at the time. Uh, she got a clue. She got a daily double wrong. And the correct response was, what is Chicago? And she had grown up in Chicago. And she just lost her spirit. And I sailed through. I was, you know, very lucky. If you remember, how much practice did you get with your signaling device before you played the game either on set or at home leading up to your appearance okay well i never practiced like that i i never sat in front of my tv set with a clicking pen like some people did because i it it wasn't really as culty as it is now and I, you know, I tried to make sure that I knew what I was saying before I clicked in, but we had rudimentary. I mean, here you go, sit, sit at the desk, uh, call a couple clues, ring in. Everybody got a chance to ring in to make sure their machines worked. And then we were off to the races. And this is, of course, a different format than what modern Jeopardy viewers might be used to. As soon as that clue comes into view, anybody can hit their button. And so... On the older Jeopardy, there was this phenomenon of the clue getting revealed, hearing that bell, somebody buzzed in as soon as the clue was revealed, and right. Art goes to them because they buzz in first, and they have no clue. And sometimes, right. you know, I think that people who are used to the, you know, the way they do it now wonder why they even hit their button if they didn't know. But the goal really was to get in first. Whether you knew it or not, you buzz in and maybe take those five seconds while Art is reading the clue to piece it together. Mm-hmm. It's a much different strategy than, than current Jeopardy, I think. Interesting. Right. Well, I'd tell you, I was having trouble getting in, and I did that once. That was the first time I got in. I rang the second. I think I was a split second before the card was pulled. And uh, I got recognized. Now that wouldn't work because of the lockout. 
Right. They they shut mm-hmm. everything down for you for like a fraction of a second if you buzz in before that light goes on around the board, right? Which never gets seen on TV. Right. A lot of people, I think, would be surprised it, to know that. Yeah, it gets framed out, but it's no secret. What they do is the um, there is a person whose responsibility is to arm the the machine. And what they do is they have the script right in front of them. So they know what the last word of the, of the clue is. And on that last word, they flip a switch and the, the mechanism is armed and you can ring in. If you ring in ahead of time, you are uh, locked out for like two fifths of a second, which is just long enough for somebody else to get in. Uh, they, they established that at the beginning of the second season of this incarnation of Jeopardy. Right. Yeah. If you go to Netflix or Amazon, the, a lot of the first season is on Netflix. I, it's one of those. And yes, that is a huge difference that I think people, you know, notice immediately that that there's some different sounds and it just and it and uh, the pacing is a bit different, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the pacing is different. And uh, they were uh, <laughs> well, they were having some problems because uh, they shared the set. So every week they would strike the set and put it back together and find a new way to do it wrong. <laughs> right. That that fascinating first season where Jeopardy is sort of finding its feet. Mm-hmm. Now, how involved were you, Carlo, in the in the development of this current incarnation of Jeopardy, which you know started in eighty four, but it has its roots, I think, even right. a year prior. There were a couple of rehearsals and things done. How involved were you in that? Right. Well, I was a um, I was a contestant on the run through. Um, you've seen the uh, you've seen that. I mean, I, I look kind of scary. I mean, I've had you know hair out to here, and uh, you know I've cleaned up since. But you know, so one of my real skills is I can play Jeopardy, and quite well. Uh, you know, some people can sing, some people can dance, some people are good looking. I play Jeopardy, and they used me for the uh, run through. In fact, I believe you'll see some about halfway through the run through, uh, one of the Producer says, Carlo, can you not ring in on everything? Yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah, because this was a very, <laughs> it was a very rough sort of rehearsal. It was, mm-hmm. at least the tape I saw was not was not edited, I don't think, in any way. And also, mm-hmm. you know, the set is a lot different. So I think we're in 1983 oh, yeah. when we're doing this run through. So we are five, right. four or five years removed from the last version of Jeopardy. And... Mm-hmm. It's very reminiscent of the original. I mean, you have the big cardboard game board, and everything seemed to right. look got, like a Commodore got, pet computer. Yeah, it was try. Yeah, they wanted to make it look like you know one of the newfangled, brand new computers that were on the uh, market, and so everything had that computer imagery. I mean, the desks look like computers. The Jeopardy board looked like computers. I think Alex's uh, lectern looked like a computer too. Yeah, I think he even walked out. During his intro, he made his entrance from what would probably be the floppy disk drive on an Apple II. The floppy drive, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, the, the 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 little door next to the next to the monitor. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that it was. A, it's a it's it's a very fascinating watch because again, Jeopardy is one of those shows that is so ingrained in popular culture that people don't realize. Not right. only does it have a history before Alex Trebek, it has. A, I mean, it has such a. A, such a long history. I mean, it's older than probably mm-hmm. most of the people I know that watch it. Even now, coming in in 84, it's older than most of the people who watch it. Sure. But I remember the, the initial version ran from 64 to, I think, 72 or 73. 75, I think, because Wheel of Fortune premiered the following Monday. That was the trade, I think, right. that they made at NBC. Yeah, well, Lynn Bolin wanted to get rid of uh, Jeopardy, but she gave Merv first call, and he had a very short time. But it was 75, wow. Yeah, it Later lasted right until like the first week. I think it was January 3rd, because January 6th was when, was when Wheel of Fortune premiered. Yeah, it had a long history, and it stayed right. relatively unchanged for the majority mm-hmm. of that run, which I think only the price is right these days would be comparable in that it was – until recently it was the same you know day in day out for for you know for decades and that was part of its charm mm. i think jeopardy sort of attained that same thing yeah well the thing about uh price is right is it's really a bunch of different games so it, it get you know they mix it up i mean it's not like jeopardy is always jeopardy round double jeopardy round final but uh price i mean you could play 
you play six different games every show. That is true. That is true. But I think more in terms of the set design and the music and the sound effects, and even for 35 years, the host, you know, none of that really mm-hmm. changed. And as a result, it was the the hit of kids staying home sick from school. It was just they had that medicinal sort of quality to it. You know, it was always going to always going to look mm-hmm. and sound more or less the same. Right. And, and the sound effects are the same. I mean, if you uh, if you lose, you still get the, the sad trombones. I I know it personally. The, <laughs> yeah, the, the buzzer. Bah, 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 bah. Oh. That's it. That's the one. I shudder when I hear it. I could have owned <laughs> I could have owned a 2007 Pontiac vibe if it wasn't for that sound. Should have talked. You should have slipped a twenty to the sound guy. This probably would have been a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So, Carlo, you were present for the beginning of Alex Trebek's association with Jeopardy. He was the host of this run through back in nineteen eighty three, and right. I wonder what your impression was of him as a host. I know earlier you said you weren't the biggest fan of Art Fleming, and I know that in a lot of the early reviews of the current Jeopardy when it first premiered, there was a lot of flack thrown for the choice of host because at this point he was really the guy from High Rollers. He didn't have a much, right. you know, he didn't have a very authoritative. Uh, aura about him the way he did as he started hosting Jeopardy. What were your first impressions of Alex Trebek from working with him as a contestant? Um, when I worked with him as a contestant, I found him like he was really professional, uh, but he didn't take it all that seriously. He was he would tell jokes, he would throw out punchlines, uh, but at base he was a broadcaster, and he knew what to do and when to do it. But he was extraordinarily professional. So do you think that that was a difference between him and Art Fleming? Art Fleming was, I wouldn't necessarily consider him a professional broadcaster. He at least didn't have the chops that mm-hmm. Alex Trebek had at that point. Right. Well, he, well, uh, Art Fleming, yeah, he was an actor and he was jovial and he could read. And that was pretty much all he needed. You know, he, he could present the clues. And it wasn't until, you know, Alex Trebek came in. And the show grew around him because he produced it for the first four, three or four years. Now, how did that come about, and if you're familiar? I, I heard stories. But I will tell you that one of the reasons he took the gig is because he wanted to uh, get some experience producing. And it's my understanding that he, uh, made, he took less money than he would have for a straight hosting gig in order to produce. Got it. Okay. So he was, he was looking to pull double duty. Yeah, no, he wanted to. I mean, that, that was a plan. He wanted to all along and it was, and the writing was done to sound like Alex, you know, cool, smart, aloof, intelligent. Yeah, and he, he was all of that and, and much, much more. Uh, so let me backtrack for a second. So the run-through ends, and but your affiliation with Jeopardy doesn't end because you end up working for the show. In what capacity did you work for Jeopardy? I was on the research staff, but I came in the second year. Uh, they did the first year, and they were working out of a basement in Metromedia Square. And the second year, they moved across the street to the Channel 5 lot, They got their own dedicated stage, and they moved out of the basement to the top floor of a building adjacent to the studio. So they wanted to double the size of the staff, and Alex, the producer, had liked my uh, material that I had sent in for consideration as a writer, and when they doubled the size of the staff, I was the first person they hired. And now when you became a writer, what was the criteria? What did you have to submit? I was told, write some Jeopardy material. So I wrote, I was working at the LA County Museum of Art at the time, and I wrote maybe 20 categories, and I sent the best 10 in. Oddly enough, I was, I took it to Merv's old offices on Vine Street. And as I was walking down the street, I ran into a friend of mine, uh, who later became a a quite well-known movie critic, Elvis Mitchell. And... Elvis and I went to a theater and saw Star 80. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Star 80. I'm not. But it's a story of... Dor- okay, it's a story of uh, playmate Dorothy Stratton and her husband, Paul Snyder. And Snyder was kind of a jerk 
who was hanging onto her coattails. And uh, that's not the kind of movie you want to see after you've just put in your best material to be considered as a writer for Jeopardy. <laughs> right. Not the best omen, is it? <laughs> yeah, that, that is not what you that is not what you want to see is a guy who's being, you know, nominally accepted and laughed at behind his back. Right. What was it, do you think, about your material that maybe made it stand out from that of the other prospective writers? Was there a certain angle to the way you wrote questions? What made it unique, do you think? Well, two things I know that the, – because they showed me their responses later. And one was they liked a category I wrote called AA, just letter A, period, letter A, period. And then a note, say the letter twice. And I had things like Hank Aaron, Alcoholics Anonymous, just things that you could tie in with AA. And then I did another one, comic strips. And I said familial relation – of high and lowest is lowest to Beetle Bailey. And uh, because uh, Lois is Beetle's sister and none of them knew that. So they were kind of impressed with the, with the breadth of my knowledge. That's wonderful. And so how long does your tenure as Jeopardy researcher last? Five years. What a, wow. That's a, that, that's, and that's really as, so five years and he started in the second season. So we're really sort of rounding out the 80s. And that's really when the show becomes massively popular. Mm hmm. Yeah, we, we honchoed it in. Um, Alex was uh, was guiding for that first three years. And he was very small D Democratic. He always, you know, he, his office was on the corner and it, it was always open. If you need, you know, if you need to talk to Alex, you go in there and you talk to Alex. Um, if you have, if you have a problem, if there's something that went wrong, tell him he'll fix it. And he was, uh, I mean, I, I told the story in an interview with Ken Jennings one time after we got bought by Columbia pictures, we had new insurance and everybody on staff was covered by the insurance, except for Alex, who was covered by the AFTRA insurance. So we all went into the conference room and Alex booked contestants for two hours. He answered the phone, took people's names, wrote them down, and told them when to show up for their contestant tryouts. That's probably the most intimidating thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> Can you imagine getting the call from Alex himself? Yeah. Well, he said that nobody recognized him. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I would be so scared. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, when the phone rings and somebody picks up the phone and says, Jeopardy, you really don't expect it to be Alex Trebek. Yeah, oh, oh my God, it is Jeopardy on the phone. <laughs> it's Jeopardy <laughs> himself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I read a book, and this was years ago, and I'll tell you, I'm going to quickly tell you how I found this book. I used to play pool at a billiards hall near my college, and they had some sort of some sort of fake bookshelf set up to look like a, I don't know, they just had some little rocking chair in the corner and fake plant and a bookshelf. In this bookshelf was a book about uh -huh. Jeopardy that I had up to that point, I had no idea it existed. And I think it was written maybe by a former producer of mm -hmm. the show. And it's about the backstage sort of going. Is that on. Harry Eisenberg's Inside Jeopardy? That's exactly what it was. And I had no idea that that book existed. And it was just yep. a prop on a shelf. And so I gladly took it, put it in my backpack, and I own it <laughs> to this day. <laughs> so that's how I have my copy uh -huh. of it. There was a story in there. And I don't know if you were present for this. And maybe if you were, you could fill in some of the details. There was a radio contest. Everybody was listening to the radio in this particular office. And uh, one of the researchers or writers had- That's us. Okay. One of the researchers and writers had called <laughs> and they had won a trip or won a vacation or won some sort of prize that they prepared uh -huh. everybody to go on, but somehow the company wouldn't let them have the time off and it was some sort of conflict. Oh, would you know anything about that? Okay, now I, I can tell you that Stephen Dorfman was like the radio guy. He was always listening to the radio for contests, and there was a local station that would give away a trip to Hawaii. And every day he would run through the office yelling, now, now, and we would all grab a phone and start calling, trying to get in. But somebody not being able to get the time off, that must be after I left. 
Okay. Yeah, there was. A, I, I wish I had the book in front of me right now. I, of course, it's in storage right now. But yeah, it was mm-hmm. something about there was some sort of inter office conflict because they won the trip. But the company wouldn't let them have the time off, or they weren't able, somehow they weren't able to do it, or uh, some something that enabled them to not to not take the trip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that's a new one on me. I don't, you know, I could probably you know read it in the book, but I do not remember that happening. Now, at some point, you also start a gig as writer for a show, and again, a very underrated show that lasted maybe a season, maybe two seasons, called The Challengers, produced by Ron Greenberg. One season. One season. Right. Yeah, and I think... One season. One, I, I, it should have had several, because I think this is a fantastic show. This was... Mm-hmm. It's sort of like Jeopardy has its roots in right. the Who, What, or Where game, which is a show that Ron Greenberg right. produced way back, and this... Oh, yeah, Ronnie, Ronnie admitted it. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, it is definitely like the <laughs> spiritual successor, I think, of, of the Who, What, or Where game. Yeah. Uh, and He said it's the Who, What, or Where game. <laughs> while we're on that subject, at any point, mm-hmm. was this developed as, you know, stri- strictly as a new Who, What, or Where game? Well, that was the, uh, that was the bare bones of it. Um, somebody thought that what we really, that the thing that would put it over was having it based on white hot current events. And we we taped on Friday for air the next week. The shows had dates on them. Right, which was different than most other game shows at that time because all the information was based on current events, everything that happened recently in the news. Well, it was about 20%, really. Uh, we made a big deal of it, but a lot of it was standard game show stuff. But we would have these things about what happened in the Iraq war last week. I mean, that was the big deal. It was, you know, the idea was that it was based on white hot current events, a hard question game show based on, you know, literally current events. And I'd like to know some of the challenges of writing material based on what's happening in the news at the moment compared to something like Jeopardy, where you have an arsenal of encyclopedias and research and things to things to source your material with. Was it more difficult to write things for a show like The Challengers? Not really. It was sometimes you had to use the perfect tense because you didn't know that something was going to continue to be the case. So you had to say, you know, last week, this guy said that this country did that. You know, you have to be very, very specific and tie it down because things could have changed. I remember we did one a final challenge involving Armand Hammer, the you know the uh, the oil guy, and it was about the fact that he was going to, at the age of ninety something, have his bar mitzvah that had been d- delayed for a number of reasons, and now here he was, he was in his nineties, and they're going to do it. And we taped it on Friday, and he died on Sunday. And now what happens in a situation like that? Um, you put up a super that said this was recorded before the death of Armand Hammer. I mean, you can't change anything. So I, I, I guess in that way, that would present some kind of challenge. I mean, I imagine it didn't happen incredibly frequently. No, it didn't happen that frequently. I mean, um, I do know that, you know, we were in the office five days a week and uh, the old leisurely Jeopardy attitude of take one day a week and go to the library just didn't happen. I used to go to the library on weekends. I spent a lot of time at the UCLA General Research Library because I knew where everything was. But I would go in there and double check facts on the uh, on the perennial stuff. The one thing I was really proud of on the Challengers is that one of the stories that had happened that week is that Atlanta had been awarded the Olympics. And I went to the head writer and I said, if Atlanta got the Olympics, they made a bid. If they made a bid, they have an Olympic organizing committee. If they have an Olympic organizing committee, they have a logo. Want me to get it? And I dug around and I found them and they FedExed the image to us. Two pieces of paper, one of them totally black on white and one with a color key so that you could match the Pantone colors to what went where. We taped that on Friday. 
and I spent a weekend watching everything I could to see if anybody else had the logo and nobody did. And we were the first show to have the logo that Monday. I was kind of proud of that. I'll ask this question because I think that it may be of interest to people who watch game shows, but don't necessarily have a working knowledge of how they operate. When you work at a show like Jeopardy for five years, and mm. a year later you move to another show which has a similar format, requires similar material in that you're asking hard facts. Mm -hmm. How much of your material that you wrote for Jeopardy, if any, do you get to carry over to the next job? Well, I was primarily a researcher and everything I wrote, and I wrote, you know, quite a bit, but you know, not compared to say Stephen Dorfman, but everything I wrote was used. I'd done it. I mean, you can use the same fact over and over, but you can't use the same question. I mean, Stephen King is a classic example. You can talk about, you know, you can talk about The Shining and ask for Stephen King. You can talk about Stephen King and a hotel in Colorado and go for The Shining. I mean, you can take the same fact and twist it, you know, six ways from Sunday, but you can't write the same material. And I've always personally wondered what happens to the clues on a Jeopardy board that don't get used. Once that time's up sound goes off, sometimes mm -hmm. there are four or five left. Do those, for lack of a better phrase, go back into the hopper or are those just out of play? How does that work? They used to get recycled. We call them recycles. Um, in fact, that was one of my jobs at Jeopardy is at the end of each tape day, I would take the old scripts and I would uh, get an X-Acto knife and pull out the ones that hadn't been used and staple them to the card that the clue had been written on and return them to the um return them to the writer so there were you know they, there was no waste they that you ever notice that near the end of the season of jeopardy there are a lot of hodgepodge and uh, leftovers categories and the one really great thing about writing for jeopardy back then was stephen dorfman never used his recycles he had card boxes full of them and they were all gold because it all been written, roundtabled, and researched. And we go in the, you know, in the before the show run through, oh man, we need another president. And Steve would come back with like six. You know, oh, this is FDR. Can't use that. Okay, this okay, I got a Lincoln. Carlo, what elements go into the perfect Jeopardy clue? What are you looking for as a researcher? What should the viewer be looking for in terms of a quality? clue on Jeopardy? First, it should be front-loaded. What you are looking for should be at the end. The Often, when you get a stand and stare, it's because the contestants don't know what, what they want. So it should always end, you know, by this president, <clears throat> with this element, you know, under the you know, under this bridge, whatever, but it should be <clears throat> the thing you're going for should be clued at the very end. Um, I like them simple and short. Sometimes you got to be long, but you don't, you know, the fewer words, the better. Um, should be absolutely clear. There is nothing worse than people looking quizzically at the board trying to figure out what's going on. You know, it's the name of Napoleon's horse. You may not know it, but you know what we're asking for. And somebody should get it. Because if it's a stand and stare and then it doesn't resonate, you've just wasted, you know, five, eight seconds of, uh, of airtime. I mean, it's okay to have a totally off the wall clue if the response is "Who is Abraham Lincoln?" Sure, I can imagine you. You know, you don't want them so esoteric that mm -hmm. it's it's inaccessible. Or sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes you know, fortune favors the bold. Which one of the three Stooges wasn't related to the other two? Carlo, I'd like to backtrack for a second, and I can't believe we didn't talk about this sooner, but you were on the staff of Jeopardy and the Challengers, but there was a third show for which you worked, and that is. Uh, car Sharks. Now, which car version sharks. of Car Sharks is this? Very first one. 
Jim Perry, NBC. Oh, the NBC. Wow. And what did you do? Like, what was your capacity as a as a as staff on car? I had been a uh, an intern. I got an internship over at Goodson Todman. And uh, when my intern was my internship was up, they offered me a job. I was basically a gopher um, and a tallier of the answers. They would figure out what question they wanted to do and make sure we had a tabulated response. If we didn't have it, I would tabulate it. So in terms of the survey questions that they ask, those hundred people, you're the one you were the one that counted how many people said this, how many people said that. That was my responsibility. I also did other stuff. I mean, I would go out to the NBC NBC and go to the Johnny Carson line and you know, hand out questionnaires to people and then take them back. That was one of the things we did. So when Jim Perry would ask a question on the original show and he'd say, Our man on the street went to so and so. You were one of the men on the street. Uh, yes, exactly. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by that. How did, and and if you don't remember, that's okay, but, and this is more of a matter of personal uh, curiosity. What overlap was there between the material used on card sharks and the material used on family feud? D- did they come from the same people? Was it the same? Like, could you, could you repurpose a family feud type question for card oh, sharks? No. Did that happen? No, they're totally different. Because uh, Car Shark's question is yes or no, up, down. How many people said yes? How many people said no? You've got to have two options, and they have to add up to 100. Family Feud is an open-ended question, and you can have as many answers as you have people. So I, I think what I might have meant, and maybe I, maybe I didn't phrase it correctly, are the same – so the same 100 people that are asked a Car Shark's question, are they also asked a Family Feud question? Like no. when you went out to the line for The Tonight Show, mm-hmm. got it. I, w- I wanted to know if there if that was – if there was a sort of multi-purpose questionnaire that had some family feud questions, some car tracks questions, and people just – it's the same hundred people that maybe filled them out between both shows. Uh, no, we didn't do that. I, I only – I specialized. I don't know how few did their stuff. In fact, we were at 6430 Sunset, and feud was on the 14th floor with Mr. Goodson, and we were on the 10th floor. <laughs> we were the bastard child. We were on NBC, and we were getting clobbered by feud. Every 13 weeks, we would hope we'd get renewed because we were on opposite each other. Right. And that version, even despite of that, lasted a long time, three or four years. Am, am I correct? Sharks? I believe so. 78 to 81, 82? 81. Oh, yeah. I went down in 81. I was on it. You ever see the last show of Card Sharks? You can see me waving bye-bye from the, from the stage because Jim called everybody up on stage. I was wearing my red Card Shark sweater. And I would love to know if you have any recollection of working with Jim Perry, who was one of my favorite game show hosts of of, of all time. Uh, you know, we were never introduced. Um, he, you know, it was just the kind of thing I didn't feel. It was the very first show I'd worked on. I didn't feel right walking up to the star because I was like practically a nobody. And uh, he never reached out. So I never really dealt with him. <laughs> The only time I did was when somebody got sick and I had to do the cue cards after the money cards. And that was very difficult because you had to be between two cameras with a large marker and a large cardboard. And you had to write down what the person had won and then get the hell out of the way when the cameras repositioned and then hold up the card so that Jim and the contestant could see it. And, you know, there was time to get the job done, but there wasn't time to screw up or dawdle. You had to get it done and get it done right because there was no way around it if you screwed it up. I would love for you to tell me, if you could, how you met your wife. Uh, We met in 1978 in the Jeopardy contestant pool. It was during that appearance on Jeopardy that you met her, and mm-hmm. she was just, and, and she wasn't uh, somebody you played against. She was right. just no, they, they, somebody else that was there for the taping. Yeah, they saw us hitting it off and decided we wouldn't play against each other. But it was, uh, it was kind of well, it's an interesting story. We uh, we were talking about how to play the Super Jeopardy board, and uh, the returning champion said, well, "What you do is you take the corners, then you fill them in." And one of the contestants said. How do you know so much? Says, I got to, hon. I'm a Gemini. And voices started popping up all over the room. I'm a Gemini. I'm a Gemini. I'm a Gemini. Out of 12 people, nine were Geminis. We started trading birthdays. And the young lady who I later married and I have the same birthday, two years apart. 
which by the way is really great if you can pull it off. I highly recommend it. You never forget. <laughs> But we had already been uh, kind of warily circling each other because she had asked just a general question of whoever was listening at the time. What was the, though somebody else asked, what was the clue in the run through about the longest ass cap title? And she said, it's how could you believe me when I said I loved you when you know I've been a liar all my life? I'm only the second person to get it. And I walked up to shake her hand. I said, hi, I'm the first. So we, we'd been circling each other from that point forward. And then we found out we had the same birthday. We were very surprised. And That's wonderful. And how long after that initial meeting were you married? Um, seven years. Wow. We got married. We got married on April twentieth, nineteen eighty-five. The same week I started working at Jeopardy. <laughs> Amazing. Because I what a chapter change. Yeah, huh? I mean, I started working there on April fifteenth, nineteen eighty-five, and I got married that Saturday. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful story. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is kind of cool. <laughs> it got us into the pages of Real Simple Magazine. Oh, did it really? Yeah. yeah, we actually had a interesting how I, you know, how I met my spouse story to tell because uh, they put this thing out in real people saying, you know, how'd you meet your spouse? Tell us interesting stories. And apparently an awful lot of people think I met my spouse on a blind date is a real interesting story, which I suppose it is, but it's not that rare. But I met my, I met my husband when I, we were trying to kill each other on Jeopardy. Now we're talking. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> That's the way to do it. That's funny. Uh, I'll, 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 I probably won't leave this part in, but uh, game shows were sort of indirectly responsible for me for me meeting the woman that I eventually married. I've been married for five years now. Cool. But we've been together for 10. Uh, I was managing a radio station in Connecticut, and we did this fundraiser where we had the airwaves for 24 hours straight, and every hour... I had a used to have a huge collection, Carlo, of game show themed board games. I had about two hundred, wow. and so I brought twenty four of them into the studio, and we played one every hour for twenty four hours straight with no sleep, no nothing, mm -hmm. and uh, it was the longest broadcast I think in the history of Connecticut radio. We went all together for about twenty six hours. I was in the newspaper for that fundraiser, and the picture was me leaning on a stack of board games, and there was a Jeopardy in there, and there was a concentration in there, and there was a a jackpot in there and my the woman who became my wife saw that picture and added me on facebook and said happy birthday that's the first thing she ever said to me because she added me on my birthday and we've been talking ever since that was a decade ago wow cool no ga games can bring people together oh they sure can yeah they they absolutely can Carlo, more recently, you were a contestant on a couple of GSN shows. Right. So you were on Best Ever Trivia Show, right. which I think a, a lot of viewers know now is Masterminds. Master, yeah, they, and then you were also... Yeah, they retooled right. and, and then, it became Mastermind. And also, you were on a show called Tug of Words, hosted by Samantha Harris. And that was more recently. Yes, very recently. In fact, I can't talk about how I did. Oh, has it not aired yet? It has not aired Understood. yet. But that's okay. No, it, it, it's a great game. I had a grand time playing it. It's... Uh, is challenging but not impossible. It uh, makes you think and quickly. I think that's a good description for a lot of GSN original shows. I like the way they do their own game shows. There's something very cozy about their presentation to me. There's something about them that you can just sort of settle in, and it's it's it, it's it's never it's never huge pressure. It's never huge money, mm -hmm. but co I mean, cozy is the best word I could use. I think to describe how I feel about those shows. Yeah, they um, yeah they're shooting them in a uh, in a recovered uh, light manufacturing facility in Pacoima. It's a uh... It, it, it's really interesting. They they are doing it. I I hesitate to say on the cheap, but they are. Uh, it's bare bones. I mean, I'm used to being you know at NBC Network and you know Jeopardy and syndication, and then you know they they are uh, they're working on a um, on a shoestring. They're doing it, it's very friendly and very warm, and the, there's a lot of really nice stuff about it because, like you said, it's not the big bucks uh, high pressure game show. It's a game. You're there to play. And it's a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I think they do a wonderful job with their original shows. Uh, Chain Reaction was a favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that goes back years. But oh, I remember Chain I, Reaction. I used to love watching. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a yeah the game where one word leads to another. Yeah, I, mean, I remember that with Bill Collin. Oh yeah, way back, way back on 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 NBC. NBC. He was a. He was an incredible host. So, had you ever run into Bill Cullen? I wish I had. In your, I never did. Um, I, I was able to to chat with some announcers because all all of my, I, I I joke that all of my heroes have been cartoonists, drummers, and announcers, but it's really true. And um, I was able to. I had a nice talk with Johnny Jacobs on the set of uh, uh, Gong Show. And I told him that I'd been, you know, I'd been aware of it. Yeah, you know, I've been a fan of his work for a long time. And he, he was amazed that somebody even knew who he was. And I, I told him that I met him on the set of the Steve Allen show, his syndicated show in Hollywood in the early 60s. And I asked him for his autograph then. And he, and he was touched that I remembered it. And as we were talking, some kid walked up and asked Johnny Jacobs for, Jacobs for his autograph. It was like history repeating itself. So, Carlo, the National Archives of Game Show History has a specific focus on the physical elements of these shows, whether Mm -hmm. it's the sets or the props or the scripts or the question cards or the name tags. In your exploits as a game show contestant, have you ever saved anything? Is there any physical element to these shows that has specific sentimental value for you that you still hold on to? Oh, yeah. I've got a couple of the great big card sharks cards. Um, one was a face, they, they distributed a rehearsal deck after the show wrapped. And I took, I took one to the wrap party and had everybody sign it. So I've got that. Alex Trebek gave me his crystal dice from, uh, from high rollers that the staff had given him. He handed them to me and he said, they gave them to me. I'm giving them to you because I know you'll give them a good home. And I can see them from my <laughs> from my desk here. I still got those. And I also have a picture of the Jeopardy staff that uh, Alex inscribed to me. He said, Carlo, another Jeopardy souvenir, Alex. Those are wonderful things to hold on to. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm fortunate in that I, I also own uh, about 15 Card Sharks cards. I think I have the, the red deck. I have all the diamonds, and I have a couple of prize cards because I think mine were used on the later version. I think the syndicated one because there are cards with like actual prizes on them. Oh, okay. A lot of nice. people don't realize how big those cards are. They're What would you say, about a foot and a half by two feet, something like that? That sounds about right. They're the size of a small movie poster. I mean, they are big, but the thing is, you know, they're just cardboard, so they're light and they're easy to flip, but they, they're big. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they are they're definitely, you know, and they look big on TV, but they're even one of the rare times when the thing on TV is even bigger in person. Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of people say when they go to see game shows, how small That's, everything oh, is yeah. compared to what it looks like on TV. Uh, yeah, I remember people being surprised at how small the Jeopardy set is and also how big it is because we were in that first set with the gray carpet and it was like one big piece with the, with the big halo lines around it and the big Jeopardy letters. Right. Yeah. A lot of neon in that original set, if I remember correctly. Uh, The first set had neon by the second year, they had put plastic over the lights. So it didn't have exposed neon. And it was a interesting color. Uh, the, The plastic, it was dark when it was not backlit, and then when you backlit it, it became a sort of a uh, yellowish. So, Carlo, you've had experience working on several game shows, and more recently you were a contestant on a couple of them. Do you think that your experience behind the scenes of these shows gives you any advantage when it comes time to audition to be a contestant? Do you think that maybe knowing how the nuts and bolts of things work uh, gives you any sort of strategic advantage? Um, Maybe. I know pretty much what they're looking for. They want somebody who is outgoing. They want somebody who is excited. They want somebody who reacts. And so in that way, you sort of know more or less the archetype of the, you know, the contestant that they're, you know, that they're looking to cast. Right. I mean, basically, and you don't have to fake anything. You just bring out those parts of you that are like that anyway. 
because they, they can spot phoniness in a second. Do you remember your first game show audition? Yeah. It was for CrossWits. It was... Oh, that was the first one you auditioned for and the first one you made it on to. Yeah. Wow, that's lucky. It was, yeah. It was for CrossWits. And it was on... There was a building at the corner of Hollywood and Highland that they tore down to build the uh, Hollywood and Highland Center where the Dolby Theater is. And... Ralph Edwards Productions was on like one of the high floors. And there's a story about that also, but I don't want to go there just now. Uh, and they asked us, you know, tell us something about yourself. And I pulled out a very personal, somewhat vulgar story from my past by putting on the card, you'll never be able to use it on the air, but I'll tell you if you ask. And I told them the story. And apparently it made an impression because when I went to the final run through with the producer, she pulled out the card and on the card, the contestant coordinator had written Peggy, ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I pulled out the story again, got the laugh and they decided they were going to use me, but I couldn't tell that story. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Probably a good decision. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> right. What a fortunate first break that is. I, The first show I ever auditioned for was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And that was back when they were doing auditions. It wasn't the phone game. And mm -hmm. I had tried a bunch of times before I got on, but that was the first one I ever tried. And I, I, I failed miserably. Ooh. I tried out for that a couple of times. It never used me. Yeah, I eventually made it on. They started doing what Jeopardy does now. They had like an online test for one season, and then you got a video interview if you uh, if you pass that test. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I studied my ass off for that test because I figured if I get the if I get the trivia part right, I can I, I I can force myself to have a good interview. I just need to get that first part done, and that's that's by the grace of God how I made it through. But uh, yeah, I remember I. My first couple of auditions, I tried for out for that and mm. for Million Dollar Password, and I, I was just failing left and right. But mm. they're all learning opportunities, you know? Yeah. Well, the one thing I learned is don't sandbag. Never never hold yourself back. Do the absolute best you can. Because otherwise you'll wonder, maybe I should have gotten that one right. Yeah. Yep. Very good advice for any, any prospective contestants listening. Yeah. You know, Carlo, the recording of this interview is going to be donated to the National Archives of Game Show History, and they're doing an incredible job gathering the elements of game show history and putting them together in something that can be looked at and researched and visited, hopefully at some point in the future. I would love to, if you could, have you coalesce some thoughts about how you feel about this genre of entertainment, getting this type of recognition and becoming a publicly accessible archive? Well, game shows have been a very important part of my life, pretty much all my life. Uh, from the time I toddled up to uh, watch Concentration with Hugh Downs in the 50s uh, to uh, working on shows in the 70s, to being a contestant in the 70s, to being a contestant in the 2000s. Um, I enjoy the entertainment. I enjoy learning. I enjoy watching people react to what has happened when they play a game, when you toss a, when you toss a couple dice and you have to figure out what to do with them in high rollers, or if you're thrown a piece of information and you have to figure out what the correct answer is. It, it's great to see people being people and being themselves and learning about themselves. Um, game shows have traditionally been a part of uh, show business that gets very little respect. And I think that's too bad because they're very important to an awful lot of people. And I'm one of them. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is hosted, edited, and produced by me, Christian Carrion from my studio in beautiful downtown Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Co-executive producer, Corey Anatato. 
This has been a production of BuzzerBlog, the most popular game show website in the world, in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. For more information, visit museumofplay.org. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christian Carrion. Good night. This program is brought to you in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Co-founded by veteran television producers Howard Blumenthal and Bob Bowden, the archive preserves the history of game shows. Scripts, set designs, props, and other materials spanning over 80 years of broadcasting, as well as interviews with legendary game show hosts, crew members, producers, and more. From the earliest panel shows and quiz scandals, to the games and puzzles of the 1970s, to the Big Money Network series and the classic games now in primetime. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History, visit museumofplay.org.